What's up? This is Seth Mosley. I'm here at Full Circle Music Studios here with Mark Maxwell, entertainment attorney, author, believer, all around amazing person. Thank you so much for being here with us on the podcast. I'm excited to be here, Seth. Thank you so much. Yeah. So um, I want to dive in. What was the first moment that music impacted your life and you knew that you were going to run full force into it? Gosh, the first moment. Well, it's funny because I was always a music fan growing up and really, you know, loved shows, bought a lot of music, bought a lot of vinyl records when I was a kid. And I sort of fell into it by accident in my senior year in college at Baylor. I got an internship at Word Records in Waco, Texas, really because I wanted to work in advertising and marketing. And when I graduated from school, a guy named Jeff Mosley offered me a full-time job that I did not want, <laughs> but I took it because I didn't want to keep waiting tables at, at restaurants. And so I took it and then all of a sudden realized having a career in music could be an amazing thing for me, my gifts and my interests and all that. But it was something I just sort of fell into. It wasn't, wasn't my plan. So Jeff, for, for those, he's actually been on, on the podcast before. And for those who don't know, he now is the founder and owner of a label called Fair Trade Services. What was he doing at the time? He was a uh, director of marketing for Murr Records. Okay. He'd been out of Baylor for about two years. I just graduated. And he saw something in me as an intern and said, hey, when you graduate, I think you should work here. Well, I didn't want to work at a Christian record company. I wasn't interested in Christian music. It was not part of my DNA. I'd never heard any Christian artists before. I didn't even know any of the songs or anything. And um, But I started there and started kind of gradually learning about what they were doing. And then I took the job really temporarily thought, I'll do this for five or six months, but I'm going to keep looking for something else. I wanted to be in advertising. I really wanted to be the guy who's writing those amazing commercials on the Super Bowl. That was sort of my <laughs> dream at the time. And um, in the first few months of working at Word, I got saved. My life changed through people like Jeff and other people that work there and through some of the artists that were there. So it totally radically changed my life, changed my whole career direction. Now here, 36 years later, most of my work has been in the music industry for all these years. So, wow. Yeah. That's amazing. So when you got hired there, what was your initial involvement and what did that kind of tur turn into? In my first job was I was a intern in the publicity department. So I was writing press releases. I was sending out vinyl records to magazines for record mm -hmm. reviews. I was interviewing artists and writing bios. And then when I um, got a full-time job there after my internship, I did the same thing, continued doing the same thing, and then actually moved into radio promotions in about six months later from that mm -hmm. time. And one of the first records I promoted was Amy Grant's Unguarded record. It was oh, her wow. first step into the mainstream music market. And mm -hmm. so I, I, I stepped into that and was, and was really the main promoter for all the uh, radio stations in the United States and in the Christian market. Wow. And it was the, I mean, easy job promoting Amy Grant, promoting Russ Taff. It, was, it, was, uh, it wasn't much work to call up stations. Are you going to play it? They're like, yes, we're playing it. So it, it was, uh, but it was a lot of fun. It gave me a lot of great relationships around the country. And I did radio promotions for about, I think, about a year and a half, two years, and then started talking to them about moving into A&R after that. Mm. And, and, and so A&R was sort of the next evolution of that? Yeah, part of it. I felt like I learned a lot about marketing and promotion in those two years, doing publicity and then doing radio. Um, and I just wanted a new challenge. And um, so I started talking to them about moving into sort of an entry-level A&R position. And uh, ended up moving to Los Angeles with Word. And the guy, another guy who'd been one of the A&R directors, he ended up resigning from the company. And they started interviewing people who had a lot more qualifications than I. Um, and they weren't satisfied with any of the candidates. So eventually, I think all the, the president of the label and some other people just said, well, why don't we just put Maxwell into this job in A&R? So as, at, at age 24, I moved into an A&R position at the company and... and uh, Loved it. I mean, it was, it was sort of a dream job and um, had so much fun overseeing records, signing artists, um, you know, helping to be the champion within the company for those artists once their mm. records were completed. And, and so it was, it was a dream and getting to travel and, you know, sort of explore and look for new artists around the world. And so, yeah. yeah. And your story is so interesting because, you know, a lot of people would, would get that dream job 24 years old, you know, chase that until whatever the next thing is, you're whatever, move up to VP of A&R and then senior VP of A&R and then run the whole label. But that didn't really happen. Like you at some point made a decision to just jump ship and go to law school. Yeah. Can you can you talk about what was behind that? Yeah, it was really about Nashville because at the time I was in Los Angeles with Word and they started saying, 
we're going to close the office here and we're going to move you. So much of Christian music in the early 90s was starting to move to Nashville. And so they said, we're probably going to close the office this year. So if you want to keep your job, you're going to have to go to Nashville. Well, my wife and I were opposed to the idea of living here. Mm. We did not want, I mean, we love visiting. It's a great place to visit. But the idea of living in Nashville was just not, you know. It wasn't our, a cool city. It was then. not. It was very different <laughs> in 92. Um, and so I started praying a lot that year and just saying, God, what am I supposed to do? So honestly, I thought I was going to stay in Los Angeles. I started talking to other mainstream record labels and trying to find something that would keep me there. And in the midst of that process, God really spoke to me very clearly. And and one night in May of 1992, he said, the answer to what you're seeking is you're going to actually go to law school. And I was like, I'm too old. At that point, I was almost 30 years old. I was like, I'm too old to go to law school. I've, I've missed that window. And he's like, no, it's by my spirit. And I said, well, I'm not smart enough to do that. And he said, it's by my spirit. And so it was sort of a bit of a wrestling match, but it was something totally unheard of. I'd never thought of, never dreamed of, but God sort of planted it into my heart. Mm. And so we mo- ended up moving here that fall. But in my mind, my thought was, I'm going to probably move back to Los Angeles to go to law school. Mm. And that'll be the continuation of my career. And finally, I did. It took me three years to finally do it. Just a lot of different things happened in the interim. And, um, but I'll never forget standing up in the summer of 95 in front of the company at Word and in front of all the staff and announcing my resignation. Mm. And I was going to law school, and people just fell out. It was, it was one of those – no one could imagine me as a lawyer. No one could imagine me <laughs> uh, leaving a great job like A&R and going back to law school. So it was, it was one of those – and to this day, here you know, almost 20, 24 years later – when I see people I haven't seen in a long time, they're always like, well, I still never forget when you resigned, you left that company, and you moved, you left to go to life. I can't believe you did that. It's like, well, it was, it was something the Lord challenged me, and it was definitely a step of faith. It was a big one. Well, man, uh, you know, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. But just big, uh, I don't know, I just, want, I just re- really respect that. Anytime that somebody hears something from God and doesn't question it and just goes into it, I mean, was that... Like, did you have kids at the time? No. My daughter was born in my third year of law school. So we left um, without kids. And we had not even bought a house. We hadn't bought a home in Nashville yet. So we basically were like sort of delaying having kids. We hadn't bought a home yet. So we think, okay, we thought. So I actually was in law school from age 32 to 35. Okay. And um, it, it, was a, it was a step of It was hard. I mean, it was, you know, my old pastor used to always say, if you're not in over your head, you're not probably fully in God's will. And boy, mm-hmm. three years, I was way in over my head. It was yeah. so far beyond my natural ability. But I knew it was what God, it, it was his assignment for my life. You know, I've, I've always felt like one of the keys to life is to live your life by assignment. And that's something I was taught very early. And so I've always said, okay, God, what's your assignment for me? It's not my dreams, but it's your dreams. It's not my plans, but it's your plans for me. Mm-hmm. And, and that was definitely a step uh, in, in that, in, in, into that, in terms of that step of obedience with the Lord, that um, there was moments when, and, and still to this day, it's funny. You know, you, you you become a lawyer, you go through a rough year financially and different things that you face, and um, the, the the great safety net is always to say, God, this was your idea. Right. This wasn't my plan. <laughs> I had I had nothing to do with this. Yeah. So you're going to have to meet my needs this year. I don't know what's going on, but and so be, to be able to live that way in anything that you do. It releases all the pressure. The pressure is gone from your shoulders, and you put it back on God when you're living your life according to His plans for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's so good, man. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of people listening who um, can resonate with that, with that that feeling of like maybe being in a season where they're over their head, they're you know out of their depth. And sometimes that means you're in an area that you shouldn't be in, but other times that means hey, this is an opportunity to grow in faith. So I love that. Um, can you talk about, I, I want to dive really briefly before we get into what I'm really interested in is, is this, your uh, book, Networking Kills, which um, I, I self-admittedly have not read it yet, um, but I know about it because Stacy and Rachel in, in our office were raving about it, how much they loved it, how much they learned from it. So I'm really excited if, if you'll sign it for me. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> and I do want to dive into that because that's, that's, that's really big. And also this, this is, yeah. this is really smart. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I want to talk just because, you know, so, much, so many of our audience um, have questions concerning the legal side of things because mm-hmm. it's just like a gray area for people who haven't been to law school or don't understand the music business or, 
you know, why. So if, if it's cool with you, can we dive into just a few quick kind of more questions along sure. the, the law side? Oh, yeah. Cool. Um, so let's start with just deals in general. I know I know one one point that a lot of people bring up is, well, if it's a relational business and it's relationship, business, why do you need a contract? Why do you need this big, long piece of paper? And why are contracts so complicated? Like, why not just have it be a handshake situation? What would what would your response be to somebody who, that had that question? Well, you know, I think that's risky. I mean, there, there's room for misunderstanding, you know. I, but I, I think I'll come on the relationship part because the thing I'm always counseling young creative people on is that it does start with a relationship. And so often someone will come to me with a contract and, and I'll say, well, wh- what do you know of this company? What do you know of this guy that wants to work with you? Oh, you know, I just he found me on the Internet. We've not even met. He sent me this contract from Los Angeles and we had a couple of phone calls. And I'm like, okay, wait a second. You know, number one, before you even think about a contract, you, you want to build a relationship. I always say that, um, you know, the, the the person, the relationship is more important than the paper. And so, before you sign any sort of contract, you want to really get to know the people. What are their character? What's their character about? Are your are your values uh, aligned with this person or this company? Have they had success at what they say they can do? Is it true success, or do they just have some gold records on the wall and they claim success? Right. And and what do other people that work with them say about them? And so I, I always say you you really want to spend time. It's it's a, it's a sort of a dating relationship. Is this someone I really want to work with? And so. Hold off on the contract. Spend that time. Build a relationship. Make sure it's really someone that you trust and they get you and you know they're going to do what they, they say. And so then when someone comes to me with a contract, that's always my first question. I said, let's, let's not even talk about the contract. Let's talk about how well you know this company and this person. Mm-hmm. Is it? And that's really the first question. Is it a real deal? And I think that relationship and the person that wants to work with you determines if it's really a real deal. Then if it is, then how can we do the contract? And honestly, I'm a believer in doing contracts as simple as possible. I don't think a lot of attorneys think that way. But if a contract can be shorter and simpler and understandable for a young creative person, all the better. But it still has to be it has to it has to have the right kind of scope that addresses all the potential misunderstandings and things too. So I'm all for simplicity. Um, but I mean, one of the the biggest problems I've had as an attorney over the years, you get that call from someone who says, "Yeah, I probably should have called you a year ago before I signed this, and I meant to. Now I've got all these problems." And inevitably, that's the most painful call because then they send you this contract that they signed and you see that the provisions, they're not customary. They're very overreaching. And now they've got a manager or a record label who's not even returning their phone calls. So then you spend so much more time and money dealing with getting out of this contract or resolving the contract than if you would have spent a little bit of time on the front end. So I always tell people, you know, don't ever sign anything with anybody without having an, either an experienced attorney or at least an experienced music business professional who understands contracts, yeah, yeah. not just a regular attorney, but someone who really understands music contracts. You never, I don't care if it's a paragraph. I don't care if it's two paragraphs. You never sign anything. In fact, I have a lot of young creative people, I look, I say, you don't have to hire me today, but promise me you'll never sign anything without hiring someone like me. I don't yeah. have to be your attorney. And, they, and I say, please nod your head. Say, yes, I will never sign. So that's, yeah. that's really important. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so you view it almost as, okay, this is a way, and I like how you, how you, how you worded that too. It's a way to prevent any misunderstandings Definitely. down the road, which Definitely. in the music business, there are a lot of areas and room for that to happen because it's changing so rapidly. Sure. So with contracts, how do you know that you've kind of, I don't know if this is the, if the right term, um, I'll just say future proofed from like what you, you don't know what you don't know. I mean, obviously streaming 20 years ago wasn't really a thing so are there are there things to kind of people should be doing and thinking along those lines in terms of sort of future proofing their deals or is that kind of why they're sometimes so long and complicated because they are you know just trying to reach for anything yeah i mean the streaming has brought a lot of changes i mean i I don't know what sort of changes we're going to see in the next five or six years there certainly could be more and more certainly things like youtube is bringing a lot of monetization for for uh, artists and producers and songwriters now too a lot of that's kind of been addressed you know and so i mean the good the, the good news is i'm seeing you know most labels for the most part are simplifying their approach to agreements some so for so long 
the agreements were sort of based on all this litigation. And so Sony and, and Warners and Universal ended up with these 50, 60, 70, 80 page agreements. Mm. Independents have sort of blown those up. They've done a much simpler approach that still addresses those kind of future uncertain contingencies with creative work and all. And um, and I think, you know, again, if you're working with people that are trustworthy to begin with and people that are really artist friendly in their dealings, mm. they're going to address those those surprises or changes in in terms of customs and things in the industry and and I, I think most of the people that that I get to deal with I you, you see that and they're like okay okay now we we didn't really address this early on we did this deal five years ago how can we fix it and you go back to them and they're willing to address it and and make those amendments which I think again it, it all goes back to having the right relationship with the right kind of people that you're engaging with in contracts I think sure so, yeah which I, I'd love to piggyback on that. Obviously, being in, in the right relationship with the right label or publisher is very important. How does an artist or creative kind of go about finding the right attorney? Like, what, 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 how do you advise people to handle that process? Well, I think, I, I think honestly, you need to sit down with them or at least have a good phone call. I usually, I, when someone's interviewing me, they're talking to a couple of other attorneys and I'll tell them the things that, you know, I, I certainly have a certain way of doing business. I'm a solo practitioner. I'm not with a big law firm. I think that gives me some uh, advantages in terms of how I bill and how I work with people and my workload. Um, but it may, it may limit the scope of what I can do. Whereas it was a if I was at a big firm, I may be able to offer services in terms of wills and trusts and all sorts of different things, you know. Certainly, I, I, think, I think it's personality. I think it's relationships. I think it's skill. And, and, um, and I think a lot of attorneys have certain understanding of different uh, niche areas of, of different genres of music. Certainly, there's certain attorneys. All they work in is the country market. There's other attorneys that all they work in is pop and hip hop, you know, and and uh, so I think part of it is kind of understanding. Does this attorney have the understanding of some of the customs in that in that niche genre that might be helpful? But it, but overall, a lot of the agreements sort of they cross genre to genre too. So, but but I think it's you know it's interviewing different attorneys, it's understanding and hearing from their other clients. I always tell people if they're interviewing me, if they want to talk to any managers I work with or any artists I work with, I'll give them people they can talk with. Yeah. But I think it, it's it's any sort of situation you want to, you want you know you're as the artist you're sort of the you're reaching out and you're engaging all these different people to be your team and you really want to understand what that person brings to the table and and certainly there's attorneys that are I would say there are more deal breaker attorneys than deal maker attorneys and and what do you need in that situation are you trying to get out of a deal or are you uh, in a situation where you're trying to really cooperatively get something done get it done quickly and have everybody satisfied and start moving something forward creatively so I think sometimes that's part of the decision too is what sort of personality do I want here in terms of the the counsel and the engagement that I'm going to get as well so well that's that's really wise because you talked about yeah there's deal maker attorneys and deal breakers I I don't fully know what that means but I I have to imagine that maybe your deal makers are going to be a little more greasing the wheels up front maybe a little more personable deal maker deal breaker would come in with the what the iron hammer and is that is that kind of definitely definitely it's you know and some clients prefer one over the other based on their situation you know if someone comes in and they've got a lot of leverage and they've got a lot of labels that are sort of courting them they want they they may want an attorney who's a little more selective and aloof in the relationship if they've got one person and this is really important to them and they've been trying to get this thing done for a couple of years they don't want to waste a lot of time. They want to get in and start making a record and get things moving. So I think, I think those are all things worth considering, too. Um, and I think, um, and, and ultimately, I think if you're an artist, having a, an attorney that your manager really enjoys working with, because what I'll see oftentimes, I'll do a, I'll do a lot of agreements for an artist before they have a, ma- a manager. And so then the, the key to the ongoing relationship is how well do the manager and I interact because as that artist gets busy they're talking to me directly less and less and a lot of the communication is going through the manager so so that's really important too i think is having a a, a, an attorney that your manager and and same with your business manager your business manager and your manager both really enjoy uh collaborating with them because there is it's there is as an artist becomes more more successful there is a collaboration between the management and the attorney in so many different instances okay yeah and my, my last question, kind of along these lines, only because we get it a lot, is at what point in your career do you start to look for an attorney? Like, when is it too early? When is it too late? Like, when when is the right time? Yeah, I, I think 
for most creatives, the time when you're actually engaging with a producer and either that producer's asking you to commit to something long-term with recordings or that you're bringing a nice chunk of cash to that producer to help you make some recordings. I think that's eight times out of 10, that's the first step for most as, as, artists. As an artist. As an yeah. artist. And, you know, yeah. you really want to have some documentation if you're bringing $20,000 to a, to a uh, producer who's going to make four or five masters for you. Um, or they're going to require you to enter into some sort of agreement. Or if you're being offered a management agreement, or if you're being offered a, to sign a management agreement, or if you're being offered a recording agreement or a publishing agreement. Those are really the, 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 key, the key points for most creatives. Now, a, a lot of, you know, if you're, again, if you're forming a band with a lot of different partners, there could be a partnership agreement you might want to consider. If, if not an agreement, you definitely want to have some understanding about who owns the assets, who owns the name. Those kinds of things are important. Most people don't spend the time and money with an attorney early on when they're thinking through those things. But again, if you can somehow document that in some way, that's going to be really helpful. Mm, that's so. awesome. One thing that I really appreciate and have, have grown to appreciate about you is your heart for teaching and bringing up the next generation. So part of the way that you do that is you've been, you know, a, a professor at Belmont um, for a while now. So can you talk sure. about maybe how you got into that? Why, why do you still do that every year? Oh, yeah. So it's interesting. I was we, I was actually part of a church plant up in Nashville. kind of, and, and the goal with this church plant was to really reach students at Vanderbilt and, and Belmont. And so we were starting to have different little Bible study meetings at coffee shops up in that area. And uh, I, I walked out of Bongo Java late one night. Everybody left and stood on the deck and just looked over at Belmont. And I felt very clearly that God sort of gave me a, a, a new assignment and said, you're supposed to be on that campus. And I'm like, doing what? I mean, I used to do landscaping a long time ago. It looks really, I could help with that maybe. But I didn't know what that even meant. But it was like one of those callings that God put on my heart. So I basically got a meeting with the, um, the dean of the music business school. And I didn't even know what I really wanted to say, but I just kind of met with him. I said, listen, I, I'm an entertainment attorney in town. I'd love to figure out if there's a way I can serve you in some way. I said, I could, I could mentor graduating seniors who are thinking about going to law school. He goes, wow, that'd be great. I'd love to, for you to do that. And I said, well, I could, you know, years ago when I did A&R, um, I used to judge talent competitions, that sort of thing. If you ever need me to do something, I said, I could speak at events. He goes, boy, we'd love to consider you for all that. And then he said, you know, have you ever considered being an adjunct professor? And I was like, what's an adjunct professor? And so then he, he basically sort of laid that out for me. And um, the next thing I knew, I was standing before a class of 30 18-year-old freshmen who'd come from all over the country mm. to, to sort of find their dreams in Nashville. And I remember walking into the class and um, walking to the building going, oh my goodness, this class is from 6.30 to 9.15 on Thursday nights. It's almost three hours. What am I gonna, how am I gonna do this? And I remember just walking in and I was nervous. I was like, how, how am I going to pull this off? I, I mean, you know, what, what am I? And I just, I, and I prayed for my students and I remember just opened my eyes and, and God just gave me this peace. And the next thing you knew, the, the three hours was gone and I began to see how this assignment from God was something um, that he wanted to use in my life. And it's, it's funny because so many times in my life as a believer, I've been frustrated about how so many of the people in my life are believers as well. And I'm like, how do I engage with more people that need to know Christ? Um, and so being put into a college classroom has given me that opportunity, not, not only to engage with students who, who don't know Christ, but also to engage with students who are sort of going, do I really still believe this that my parents taught me growing up? And how am I going to walk this out now that I've left home and left mom and dad? And so for me, it's become, um, and I always say, I, I feel like I'm a uh, a missionary disguised as a professor. Mm -hmm. and, and honestly, it's like I get to go on a missions trip twice a week uh, as a professor on the Belmont campus. And just by showing up and caring and, um, and engaging with students, I've seen the most fruitful ministry ever happen in, mm -hmm. in my, all my years uh, as a believer. And it's something I've been able to include my wife in, my kids in. We have parties every semester at my house, class parties. I try to have coffee or sushi with every one of my students each semester, just mm -hmm. at least try to have one one-on-one -on -one with every one of them. And just, awesome. just by getting in their lives, it's interesting how God just, they just open up to you. And I've, I've seen 
almost weekly, I've seen really dramatic things happen. Um, so it's really, it's funny because the, the class preparation and the lecturing and the grading, that's a lot of work. But the real payoff is when I sit down one-on-one with a student and say, what's going on? How can I help you? What's yeah. going on in your life? Where, where are you going with your career? Where are you, what are you struggling with? And, and just seeing how they open up and how in each one of those situations, they're all unique, how God gives me different ways to sort of step into their lives and, and encourage them and love them and, and see a lot of them come to Christ as well. Mm, that's uh, that's yeah. so awesome, man. I love that. Well, um, as we kind of talked about, you know, networking, it's it's something that we talk a lot about. We teach it in our, our baby steps, at, at, you know, with uh, the, the Music Academy. Um, you know, baby step three hits a lot on networking and going out and seeking out people that can kind of help, uh, you know, take your career to the next level. But um, I love that you kind of take this idea and flip it on its head. It's networking kills success through serving. So... Um, why did you write a whole book on the topic of networking? Sure. Well, I think it really came out of my, my time as a professor at Belmont. And what I began seeing very early on is the pressure. I mean, there's professors that, that I teach with, first day of class to an 18-year-old, they'll say, listen, get your pens ready. I want, I want you to hear what I'm saying. This is the most important thing that you're going to hear the entire semester. Okay, you ready? And they're like, okay, what is it? If you don't start networking today, you're not going to find a job when you graduate. Mm -hmm. And so students are like, okay. So from the very first step into their college life, this burden of networking is placed on their shoulders. And so 90% of them cave under that burden. 10% thrive, I think, under it. But 90% don't know what that even means. And what they begin to do is they begin building inauthentic relationships. They begin... um, chasing after people that they're not really meant to be chasing after. And instead of building relationships, they end up destroying relationships and they end up finding less opportunities instead of more opportunities. So I just began, you know, looking at over, over my own career, because I've certainly been, you know, I've been in my own solo law practice for 21 years. I've had to build and market my business. I've had to find, you know, so, so I started to begin just to evaluate my own career and what's worked and ha- what hasn't worked. And also said, okay, what is, what, I sort of look through my worldview as a Christian worldview, so I look through everything in business. What does the Bible teach? And I said, well, you know what? This theme of networking that so many people teach from podcasts to business books and everybody, it's sort of the mantra for a student, for someone to start, want to start their own business. I, I just feel like it really con- contradicts with what Christ teaches. And and so I begin to look at his teaching, and you know, when he sits there and, and encounters sort of the ultimate stage mom— you know, the mother of James and John, she comes to them with her two teenage boys and says, I want my sons to be on your right and left and to be number one in your kingdom. And, and, and Christ is like, you don't even know what you're asking, do you? Mm. And he says, if, you know, if you want to be great, if you want to be successful, it's about becoming a servant. And so I, I think that theme is really what I began to see. It's really worked in my own business. It's like, Again, and I'm talking about the traditional definition of networking, which is basically collecting and building relationships to advance your own career. That's really the traditional definition. Yeah. Christ says that's not it. He says if you want to if you want to be successful, if you want to have impact, if you want to have influence, it's about serving others. It's not about taking from others. It's about mm. loving others and being generous. It's not about exploiting others for your own personal gain. And so that's his theme. And I think even for me, I've seen throughout most of my career when I've sort of stepped in, again, you have to market. Marketing is different than networking. But but when you step into a situation where you're looking to meet someone or or connect with someone for your own benefit, nine times out of ten that backfires one way or the other. So if you begin, and and I don't advocate state advocate staying at home. No, no, go out to things you're supposed to go to. But again, number one, make sure there are things you're supposed to go to. Is this something God's calling you to go to? Is this important to be at? And then number two, are you going to that event or that opportunity for your benefit or for other people's benefit? So if you step into an, a, a social event or a concert or a, 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 some sort of gathering or conference, are you going for you or are you going for others? And so if you begin to step into those opportunities where you're there to meet the needs of others instead of your, yourself, that's where God brings blessing. He brings blessing not only for them but for you. That's yeah. just sort of his law. You know, his, his law is based on 
sowing and reaping, and, and, and as you give, you get. And so if you step into those kind of opportunities, God's going to take care of you. Mm. But I think he's looking for us to be thinking about others first. And I think the whole theme about networking is really, it's really flipped in that way. And so it's funny because as I began teaching that in the classroom, I started doing a lecture on that topic. And I would usually do it one semester in some different context. And afterwards, students are, would just come up and they're going, I cannot tell you how much that helps me. That just pulls this burden. It sort of pulls these, it goes, that I can do. If I'm about building relationships to serve others as opposed to serve myself, I can do that. And that feels right instead mm-hmm. of feeling slain. You know, there's even a, a recent Harvard study that talks about um, the psychologists did this study and they, they interviewed people coming out of professional networking events. And they would come out and they would actually yeah. feel physically dirty. Mm-hmm. And they refer to it as the Macbeth effect. So there's actually a psychological problem. So, you know, it's not only psychological, but it's spiritual. I think God's identity within all of us, all of mankind, is about serving and it's about loving. That's his identity in us. And so when we enter into relationships based on his identity, we find there's peace, you know, there's joy in that as opposed to striving and, oh, that was awkward. And what was, oh, yeah, that, you know, it's awkward for you, but yeah, it's also yeah. awkward for the person you're trying to network with, you yeah, know, so. Yeah, man, I love that. And, and, and a really good way for that, and really, I love this because it's straight out of the Bible, is to, to start by serving, you right. know, replace that word networking with serving. So right. can you maybe offer some practical advice? Because I'm just putting myself in the shoes of, you know, somebody who's, you know, early in the process. They're in baby step one or they're working their way towards baby step three and it's almost time to network. How, how do people even practically find opportunities to to serve? Like where are there specific events and things people should be looking to go to, to help out, like any, any practical advice along those yeah, lines? Yeah. Well, I think if you're a creative, if you're, if you're a performer, if you're an artist, I think number one, see that serving helps erase the fear of failure, fa- failure. Because when you step out on a stage or you step into a boardroom to make a presentation, if you make that opportunity about the people in front of you instead of yourself, you're, you're coming into that, onto that stage with your gift, with your voice, with that song mm-hmm. to bring joy and hope and empathy. And you step onto that stage where you're really focused on that audience and you're giving them a gift, then all of a sudden the stage becomes a place of love with peace mm-hmm. instead of a place of, of rejection and failure. So if you're looking at them instead of you, then, then the applause doesn't matter. It's not about the applause. It's about what you can give. So you step into that as a young creative, you begin to perform and, and do things with that mentality, then the fear of failure is, is, is gone. Mm. You know, for me, I think, um, you know, I, I, I've made the mistake of, you know, going to conventions in the past. In fact, years ago, I, I often tell a story. I went to South by Southwest in Austin with the, for the sole purpose of finding new clients. I really felt like I wanted to grow my clientele in, in the rock um, market mm-hmm. and more of those bands. I handed out business cards. I shook hands. I met so many people. And I came back home, invested a lot of time, a lot of money, came back home, waited for the phone to ring. Crickets. Mm. Nothing. Not one client. And I remember sitting there with, with God and saying, God, what? And first off, he said, did you ask me about going to Austin? No, sir. He's like, mm. that was wrong. And he said, and, and then he's, his next question was, while you were there, you were surrounded by broken people, drunk people, hurting people. How much did you share love with them? How much did you share me with them? How much did you? And I said, not really at all. Mm. And he's like, don't ever do that again. And so in that situation, you know, the world says you got to make yourself visible mm. to be successful. But I think God's strategy for us is we make ourselves available. And we make ourselves available, we're giving value to others. And that value lasts. So... You know, if you're a young creative person, you're like, what do I have to give to this guy who's an established record producer or this person who's had all of this success? There's still something, you always have something to give. You know, even in those situations, you know, th- there's someone that you can encourage, even just by telling them how their life or their success has been an inspiration to you mm. by communicating that mm. by a letter or in person after a conference. That's serving that person. Yeah. Maybe you sense in that person that you respect there's something or you've read about in, in uh, the media that they're going through. Well, you pray for that person. You know, one of the things as an attorney, oftentimes I'll find myself on the phone 
with someone from Beverly Hills or New York City who's a lot smarter than I am, who's a lot more successful than I am. And my inclination is go, to go, oh, gosh, this is intimidating. How am I ever, ever going to get this deal done? This guy's like, you know, yeah, he, yeah. he works with Katy Perry or he works with whoever. And, um, and often in those situations, the Lord reminds me, and you, you have my spirit within you. This person has no eternal hope. And you're going to be intimidated by them? What you should be doing is stepping into that phone call or that relationship, praying for that person, praying for their mm-hmm. family, praying for their marriage. And so sometimes even serving in, in a conflict in that way, in, in, a, in a business setting, it's, just a, it's, such a, it's a great equalizer. All of a sudden, you really get your heart right and begin to serve just through prayer and for care of that person. And you just watch the Holy Spirit work. All of a sudden, this deal you think that's never going to get done is done. And that attorney's like, hey, next time in Nashville, I want to really sit down with you and get to know you more and have lunch. Mm-hmm. And so things change when you really enter into those relationships with that heart of serving. So mm. That's so good, man. That, that's such, such good advice. Good. That, that I'm, I'm convicted myself listening to, to, to you talk about that, that. Sometimes it is that simple as just encouraging somebody or praying for somebody. Sure. And, and that is serving them. Sure. That's awesome. Um, I want to just really quick address somebody that maybe has made the move to Nashville or to L.A. They've, they've jumped in. They're pursuing this, this dream of music, and it's maybe not working out. Um, how might you address them and encourage them to sort of follow God's leading in a season where it just feels like they're kind of banging up against the wall? Yeah. Well, I, I think you, you want to have strong partners around you. You know, I think a lot of creatives tend to get isolated to begin with. And I think it's important to have pastors, leaders, parents, people that are for, people that are sort of walking that journey with you mm. and saying, when you say, you know what, I feel like God's got this plan for me, they're challenging you. And they're, they're either going, you know what, you're right, he does. And we're with you and we're praying for you. Um, and so I think to really view your life as a team, and number one, that, that that's going to help you when you hit those because sometimes it's like a, a lot of times you know people think gosh you know the door's not opening and I don't know, understand and sometimes it's, it's a matter of um, we're supposed to be persistent and that there is a, there's a time of knocking at a door before it, before it, before it opens and there, there, there's other times when you can be creative enough or charismatic enough to where you can open any door well that doesn't mean any door is supposed to open to you or you're supposed to go through any door either so I think I think part of it is is having a team people that are speaking into your life, they're encouraging you, and, and recognizing, honestly, the thing about any creative pursuit, it's the most difficult vocation to pursue and actually make a living doing it. Mm. In any area of creativity, but especially in the music industry. Mm. Very few succeed, very few make a living at it, so the odds are small to begin with, and you have to rec- recognize that. And knowing that, then I think it's really about work ethic, it's about being a person of character, you know, I think the examples I've seen over the years in Nashville, the people who've had the longest careers, they're usually not the, the A-plus superstar creatives. Mm-hmm. They're usually the B-plus people, but their character. The mm-hmm. character's there. It takes them for decades, you know, and they have a strong work ethic, you know, and that's what a lot of people miss, especially the most talented. Often the most talented person in the room, they don't have the work ethic, they don't have the character, and so their careers last a year or two, and they're mm-hmm. gone. You know, everybody loves them. They think, oh, my gosh, I've never heard a writer like this. I've never heard a singer like this. But it's the people, you know, I always say, um, you know, in the long run, character trumps talent. Mm-hmm. It just does again and again and again. And, um, and, and, and people in the industry, they want to be around people that are going to work hard. And the people are just pleasant to be with. They're a good hang. Those two things will get you so much further than talent. And people don't realize that. They really will. And um, so then you got talent too. Then you're going to be unstoppable. Yeah. You know those three things together, and and and, and doors will open. But I think a, a lot of people give up prematurely. I think mm-hmm. there's a, a work ethic, as you know, with what you do. I mean, you listen to a lot of music. You make a lot of bad music before you make great music. You write a lot of bad songs before you write great songs. But you keep doing it. Mm-hmm. There's a consistency. I think that the greatest creatives find where they continue to do it daily and they don't stop and they keep doing it. And a lot of failure precedes success. And I think a lot of people give up way before they should, you know, but again, I think you want to have that team that helps you to know, okay, maybe you're knocking on the wrong door. 
maybe your place of success is going to be over here at this door. Let's let's help you, mm. and then you're not making that decision on your own. Mm. You know, so good. That's that's great advice. Well, um, as we're kind of wrapping up, I'd love for our audience just to learn a little bit about. Can you can you just fill us in on this book? Maybe catch us up if somebody is uh, interested in checking it out. Um, Networking kills. Yeah, yeah. What's what's it all about? Yeah, yeah. So you know, basically, I kind of it's really a view of um, it's it's meant to be pr- provocative, obviously, because so many people believe in networking. So it's a bit of a challenge and a pushback, and to get people to think about what's really important in terms of relationships. And and I do believe, like I said earlier, I believe what Jesus taught about success is true, you know, and that's where we find purpose, you know, and um, and success really we. You know, social media and all that sort of speaks so much the opposite of what true success is, you know, because we all think and, and, you know, social media can convince a young creative that they're much further along than they really are. They, mm. they can convince them that their music is better and their songs are better because all they're focusing on is how many likes and views and followers that they have. Mm. And so what I'm saying in this book is like, let, let's put that aside for a minute. If you really want to make an impact on the world and you want to be successful creatively, It starts with hard work. It starts with really being diligent, really studying the grades, studying the people that are amazing creatives and writers and songs and learning how to do that. But then if you as you want to grow in opportunities, it's really one person at a time, you know, serving. It's, you know, because you can say, I don't have enough money. I don't have enough resources. It starts small. It's you start with that one person in front of you. And then maybe the next day it's two. And, and then you begin to see as you engage with people about whatever kind of business you're doing or charity or nonprofit you're building or whatever it is you're building. It's, it's really about giving to others. And that's where you're going to find purpose and contentment. You know, it's yeah. like when people are th- solely focused on finding that next job about, oh, is this going to be a great place for me to grow? That's secondary yeah. to the question, is this going to be a great place for me to give? And as you step into any job or any opportunity saying, what are, what are my gifts going to bring to this situation? What are my gifts going to do for those people? Is that group of artists at that company going to be a great place for me to serve where they're going to benefit me? And is where I am currently coming to an end? Is my assignment at this other place coming to an end? And so I think part of it is just saying, what did, what did Christ teach about success? Where do we find it? And I think it's about, you know, what he, what he said to James and John. It's about laying down your life for others. And as you begin to live that way, God prospers you. He not only prospers others, but he prospers you because your heart is aligned with his heart for others. Mm. And then you find purpose and contentment in that. Whether you're starting a job at Starbucks, you know, again, when you live that way, God can turn the most boring job or the most difficult job into a dream job when your eyes are focused on those around you as opposed to, am I getting my needs met? Am I getting all that I need here? Yeah. Always flip, when you flip it, then that's where you find purpose and it's ultimately where you, you're able to change the world and make an impact. Mm, I love it. So good. Networking Kills, people can check it out. Amazon, I guess your website, yep. anywhere books are sold. Yep. Is it an audiobook as well? Too? Audiobook. Yep. Audiobook uh, and uh, ebook. For those yep. of you who are listening and not watching, I'm holding in my hand a cassette tape. It says Maxwell on it. Uh, I love this. It's a throwback. Yep. Networking Kills. Um, is this the first? Two First chapters couple chapters of, of the audio book, yeah. Is, are you reading it? Yep, it's me. That's awesome, yeah. man. Well, um, I, I for one, am going to be checking that out. I'll probably go buy a cassette player so I can listen to it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but um, highly recommend people check check it out. I know it's great stuff just by the way that it's impacted um, you know, the people in our office, and I'm super looking forward to diving into Thanks. it. Thanks. Also so. a TED Talk out on it, too. If people, if, if, if you just have 18 minutes to spend, a lot of people don't get the whole book, so TED Talk is great, too. So. That's all, yeah, And, and yeah. how do people find that? That's on YouTube. Just search my name, Networking Kills, and you'll you'll find it on YouTube as well. That's awesome. Yeah. We'll, we'll link to all those resources uh, below the video. And, and, and really quick, just as we're closing out, um, we always do a deep dive at the end of one of our podcast episodes, or at the end of our podcast episodes. And today I thought it would be really, really cool to um to dive into what does a a good deal look like for new artists a lot of people have questions about you know they they have this there's good deals out there there's bad deals well what is an actual good deal nowadays and so we'll dive we'll dive into that if you're cool with that sure. yeah, uh, yeah. in our deep dive so sure. people can check that out at madeitinmusic.com but before we close out i do not want to miss the lightning round great thank Are you, you. Cool with that yes all right we're going real 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 uh we're going to go lightning through these things First car. Oh gosh, 
68 Plymouth Fury. It was about 40 feet long and weighed two tons. <laughs> and um, I could actually lay down in the front bench seat without my head or feet touching either side. Love so, it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, favorite uh, way to relieve stress? Uh, live concerts. Okay. Yeah. Where is the strangest place that you've ever been? Strangest place. Oh, I've been so many strange places. <laughs> <laughs> you worked in media. Yeah. Ah. Uh, you're editing this right because I can't think of anything right now. Let's see. Um, oh, I mean, I, yeah, strangest place. I honestly, to to I mean, not strange. It's a great place, but to to be interviewed on the Seven Hundred Club with Pat Robertson mm. uh, summer and a half ago that was just like surreal. I went to law school at that campus at Regent, and to actually get to go back and be. Uh, interview on the Seven Hundred Club. That was yeah. a blessed experience. I don't know if it was strangest, but it was well, like it was very surreal. I'm sure strange <laughs> yeah, in the moment. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's a good answer. Um, recommend a book to musicians that isn't networking kills. Um, can I do two? Sure. Okay. The Bible, number one. I, I just think the principles in the Word are the best for any success in life in any career. Uh, I think people overlook that um, often. And, and number two, I'd probably go with the traditional Donald Passman, all you need to know about the music business. I think he continues to update that. And it's a great, it's a great um, sort of encyclopedia on general music contract terms and the team that you put together as a, as a creative. Love so, it. Yeah. Uh, and lastly, name an artist you've listened to for over 10 years. Over 10 years. Wow. Probably a favorite would be uh, Bob Marley. Okay. Yeah. I love it. Good. That's awesome. Well, um, Mark, thanks so much for being on the Made It Music podcast. Thanks, Seth. Um, as we're closing out today, just a quick announcement. A lot of what we've been kind of talking about today, um, you know, surrounds networking, the idea of breaking into the music business. So the Full Circle Music Academy has created a program that we call the Music Industry Baby Steps. Um, there's, you know, Mar uh, Mark's just dropped a whole lot of amazing knowledge on us, ideas, uh, you know, ways to, to, to try and serve and, and get in. And we've done over 140 some episodes. So there's a lot of things that we should be doing as new artists to try to break into the business. Our goal with the music industry baby steps was to break it down and say, you don't have to do everything at once. And, and in fact, you can't, you absolutely can't, especially in the beginning. So it's really important, the order of which you do things. And that is what we have spent so much time putting into the music industry baby steps. If you're interested in checking that out, go to fullcirclemusic.com and click Academy. That's where you'll find the music industry baby steps. Um, and yeah, just can't recommend that enough. It's our, We've already seen a lot of people go through it and just experience game changer realizations of how, how simple a lot of this stuff actually really is when you break it down to it. It's not easy. It's simple. You just have to do things in the right order in the right way. So uh, fullcirclemusic.com, click on Academy for the Music Industry Baby Steps. And Mark, thank you so much again for being Thanks, on the Sam. Made It Music Podcast. My honor. It's great to be here. What's up? Thank you for watching the Made It Music Podcast Season 3. If you want to check out any of the other episodes from Season 3, click up here. And we talk in the show about these really cool deep dives with all this extra bonus content. And if you want access to all of those, click here. <laughs>